Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is my old friend, Gina Lake. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because although this is the first time we've ever spoken outside of emails, um, when I got the first email from Gina four or five months ago, it was like, old friend, sending me an email. There was, a, there was a, such a sort of a camaraderie in terms of her understanding of things and her kind of broadness of awareness and depth of appreciation and non-fundamentalist way of thinking that um, I just really felt like I knew her. And in fact, since then, every now and then I'll send Gina an email and say, what do you think about this? And how was that interview? And did I come across too, you know, fun, too fanatical or whatever? And she'll always bounce back some sage advice. So um, I've really appreciated that. And uh, it's really, I've really been looking forward to this interview. Well, thank you, Rick. <laughs> You're welcome. I've been looking forward to this interview, too, for all the same reasons. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, Gina lives down in Sedona with her husband, Nirmala, whom I'll also be interviewing um, in a month or two. And she's a prolific author. She's written about eight books now, Radical Happiness, Embracing the Now, Son of Now, Now Meets, <laughs> God now meets Godzilla. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding about those last two. But uh, she's written a whole lot of books, which I'll be linking to from BatGap.com. And um, I find her books, at least as much as I've read so far, to be as um, mature in their spiritual wisdom as Gina herself has proven to be in emails and in all the audios I've been listening to. So I'm really buttering you up here. You're going to have to li <laughs> live up to all this. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have plenty of time, as you know, in, uh, in this interview. And so I'd like to really kind of explore everything that you consider to be meaningful and relevant in, in your own spiritual journey and in, in your work as a counselor and teacher uh, with you know, many other people. And, uh, and anything which occurs to us as we go along. So perhaps we just, it usually works to start with a, a sort of a biographical sketch, you know, a retrospective on uh, how you kind of came to be where you are today. Okay. Well, I've been thinking about that a little because I know that you asked that question and I've so rarely talked about it actually. Mm -hmm. I've been um, kind of quiet about it. I, I don't really think I have that interesting a story, but uh, maybe there are some aspects of it that are interesting to listeners. Um, just basically starting off, I've always been a lover of God. Mm -hmm. I, as a child, I was brought up Catholic, and I loved going to church because of the feeling in church, the feeling I got, the connectedness it gave me, the sense of being connected to something bigger than myself has always been present. And of course, being Catholic, I thought about being a nun at times. <laughs> and uh, eventually, though, when I was 18 and started thinking for myself that I just couldn't stay with it, it was too guilt and fear-based mm -hmm. for me. And I started to see that other people actually were comfortable not believing what I believed and that they they didn't think they were going to go to hell so maybe I could actually venture out into just questioning some of those beliefs and then I, I moved into a phase this was college um, when I felt a little lost because I missed I missed the spirituality that I got from my religion and I I felt a little sad about that. And then when I encountered Eastern religions, I was so thrilled. I just was so thrilled that there were other paths out there that resonated with me more than my Catholic upbringing. Mm -hmm. So I, I started to study those kinds of things. And I've always been interested in psychic things also, being a Pisces, <laughs> we're, all, we're all very, uh, otherworldly, we Pisces, <laughs> and so I've always been more attuned to other worlds than this world, and in fact, um, growing up in a fairly dysfunctional family, 
I really didn't feel like this earth was the place for me, and there was a deep longing to not be here, really, and a lot of depression in high school, and I just got lost in playing the piano and music and singing and dancing and reading, and so I found ways to appease myself, to find some peace within a very uh, disruptive, angry household that I was growing up in. I just had to withdraw into myself, which was my natural thing to do anyway. You know, it might, it might help some people to interject here about this feeling that you had of not belonging here. You know, because there are a lot of kids these days that commit suicide and everything because they don't feel like they belong or they don't feel like they fit in. And in fact, Lady Gaga has this whole campaign now called uh, um, Born This Way Foundation where she's trying to in, in, um, give kids confidence that they're, they're fine just the way they are and so on. And I, I had a friend, a very dear friend, who was a highly spiritual and highly awake guy who killed himself a few years ago. He was a young man, about 25. Uh, because he just didn't feel like he belonged on this planet, and he thought he could just sort of check out. Um, but if this, yeah. if it save, if it by some chance saves a life for us to touch on this point, that uh, you know, I mean, in a sense, none of us belong here. You know, there's, there's, we all have a, a much higher uh, uh, dimension to our existence than we appear to have in ordinary mundane life so we're all in the same boat that way but on the other hand we all belong here because we're here mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's there's a purpose to our being here okay Rick let's get into some radical ideas right away then <laughs> yeah and we'll continue the the the, the uh, chronological <laughs> sketch too but yeah we, we yeah. can we can dive into little eddies as we go along yeah well it seems that as you said we're we're all we're all from somewhere else anywhere any anyhow but some of us do especially feel like we don't belong here that we can't relate to the war and the violence and the hatred that that goes on here i'm i'm a very sensitive person and so many of the people on the spiritual path probably all of them are similar they can't relate to this planet it seems like the planet of the apes right <laughs> They're killing people, yeah. and they're hating people, and they're, you know, there's so much horror going on here, and things that we would never consider doing. And I remember growing up in my family too, and hearing my parents argue like children with each other, and feeling like, wow, I'm more, I'm more mature than they are. Mm -hmm. And it was a strange thing to be a child and to feel like you're more mature than your, than your parents. Hmm. And they were good people, of course, but I, I just couldn't understand how they could so cruelly interact with each other. And um, in all of my metaphysical studies, I came across the idea that there are a lot of people here today and this may account for all of the awakenings, which is such an amazing phenomenon that's going on on this planet. But there are a lot of people in the body today who really didn't have to come to Earth, but they volunteered to help Earth at this very critical time because they are of a higher consciousness. They already are enlightened, if you will and are existing on higher dimensions and did not have to be here on this third dimension. But they said they love the earth and they said, okay, I, I want to volunteer and I'm willing to become fully human so that I can really relate and really understand the human condition. And then I'm going to wake up at a certain point in my lifetime hmm. and I'm going to bring forth the wisdom, the knowledge, the information, the higher consciousness from the realm that I came from. Mm. And I, I think that that may be why, and I, I haven't really heard this come out in any of your interviews, but when I've been listening to some of your interviews, I wanted to say, well, the, the movement, this movement of awakening, which is so phenomenal, where there are so many people awakening and um, awakening easily is, it, there's something going on here that's quite mysterious and and 
also, if you do look at what's going on on the Earth, it's really at a critical point. And it, it seems to make sense that um, if there are guiding forces guiding this Earth, that they would perhaps want, want to intervene, that it was, it's their job. It's my understanding that beings on other levels do take it on to guide planets and to help the evolution of humanoids on those planets. And, and this is one of the main ways that I've been told that they do help, is by sending emissaries into a certain dimension. And you, know, and you could say that Christ was an emissary, right? Buddha, the, the, the avatars, what are they? They came in enlightened. Most, an avatar, I think, by de definition, comes in enlightened. But they so didn't realize it. I mean, Buddha struggled for years before his enlightenment mm. was realized. And, and, he, and Rama of Ramayana fame, um, you know, he is said to be an avatar of Vishnu. And he, he, you know, was miserable and seeking and, oh, life sucks and, you know, it's not, nothing's worth it. And, and then he kind of worked with Vashishta, his guru, and ended up, you know, having his awakening. So it's, if, if, a, if, a, if, if we accept the... the possible validity of all these, you know, arguably mythological things, um, then if even God himself, who decides to incarnate as an avatar, can come in ignorant and have to come somehow wake up at some point, then what to say of the rest of us? Yes. So I think this is a fascinating idea that um, when I encountered it and began to talk with other people about it, they really relaxed because I was, I was um, teaching um, some New Age ideas in the 90s, and this was one of the things I was talking to people about. And the people who would come to talk with me were generally oddballs. You're unconventional, strange people who didn't fit in very well, who often had unusual experiences, maybe mystical experiences even, and who often came from dysfunctional families, which is quite interesting because many of the therapists and healers and helpers that I've counseled in the past have come from very dysfunctional families. And it seems to me that many of these more advanced beings who came to help planet Earth also chose to come into a wounding environment because that can be the grist for the mill to, to motivate the suffering that comes from that motivates people to study psychology, to get on the spiritual path, to do the work, to do the healing work of waking up. So suffering almost w uh, often wakes us up from the nightmare. So that is another, uh, uh, seems to be another uh, characteristic of people who might have come here, or beings who came here from another dimension who became regular human beings and are awakening now. And the pace of awakening seems to be rapidly increasing. It seems that the higher plan was perhaps to uh, infuse individuals in, especially born in the late 40s, like yourself, early 50s is myself, um, certainly before then too, but there were a lot of us who came in then, then who came of age in the 60s and the whole hippie movement and the peace and love and the drugs, which also played a part in opening up people's consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and you know, there were problems with drugs, of course, at, at times, but I think that drugs have actually been, in a sense, a part of the plan of awakening, and they set the stage for now all of us are, are in an, our more mature age, and um, awakening. And of course, there are younger people who are awakening too. But I've just seen this whole generation that I've been part of go through the seeking and the spiritual path and the healing work and the meditation and all of that. And now, and then in the 90s, finally, the teachers really started showing up. And the East and West came together in a way that it hadn't in the 60s. And, and then the pace of awakening just so rapidly is, is um, increasing exponentially, probably because the more people who are awake, the easier it is to awaken. And then also we have this technology. And 
I think that the internet is so key to the possibility that we actually can turn this world around without technology like the internet, without the ability to communicate, to share ideas, to share consciousness through technology. I'm not sure that all of this high consciousness coming in could even make a difference, but that the internet is all part of the plan. Mm -hmm. And who brought the internet in? I bet you anything, they're little geniuses from other dimensions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point. Um, very often when I've watched certain movies, uh, you know, like Star Wars or, or Cl Close Encounters or different movies like that, which you come away from feeling really inspired, you know, I, I just sort of um, feel that, um, you know, the guys who made the movies <clears throat> were, it wasn't merely their individual localized intelligence that was orchestrating the development of such a movie, which is going to have such a, an impact on mass consciousness, but rather that they are kind of serving as instruments uh, to, you know, introduce certain ideas uh, to a, a much larger audience, and perhaps even unaware that they're doing so. Um, yeah. And the same thing, as you say, with the internet and with all with all kinds of other things. I mean, obviously, it can be used for all kinds of creepy things too, but. Um, the, but the growth of technology does seem to be uh, keeping a pace with the growth of spirituality. I'm, I'm not sure which is the cart and which is the horse, but uh, as you say, spirituality I don't think could be growing in today's world as rapidly as it is without the technology. And perhaps vice versa, because we may have blown ourselves up by this time with technology alone and without a counterbalancing spiritual development. Yeah, well that is the problem with Earth right now, is the technology has outstripped the spiritual evolution. And so that that's what has to change. And so there's more of a balance. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the beings who came into human bodies, they're, they're working in all sorts of fields, not just as spiritual teachers. Mm -hmm. um, they're working as musicians, as artists, as filmmakers, as politicians even. Oh, imagine that, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I don't hide my liberal uh, tendencies, but I've, I've met Obama face to face three times now, and boy, he really has a lot of light, you know, a lot of yeah. inner awareness and radiance. And that, that struck me for the first time I met him early in the campaign before he was even the nominee. Um, but of course, I, you know, plenty of politicians who don't have that, and there are plenty who would d completely disagree with what I just said. Even even people I know who've been meditating for forty years hate him. So, <laughs> but uh. there's no accounting for political taste. But, but you know, I mean, on that point, it it almost seems like um, when when times are really dire, great souls are are come along to help us through it. You know, Lincoln, FDR, uh, and perhaps Obama. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I feel that way, too, about Obama. He's a horse of a different color. He's a politician of a different color in more ways than one. Mm -hmm. I mean, who would ever have guessed that someone like him would come to the forefront? And so things had to get worse before they got better, in my way of thinking. So they got really bad under Bush. I couldn't understand why that was happening. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, politics, that's a dangerous subject. <laughs> it is, and, and, you know, there are plenty of, uh, you know, very... I mean, Francis Lucille is, a, is very conservative. He really liked Bush. Um, so there are plenty of people who are highly enlightened and who have completely, who don't necessarily have liberal political leanings, and that's cool. I mean, uh, so, but, yeah, whatever, just to, just to <laughs> emphasize that, because um, mm. it would be narrow-minded, I think. Although I, I had a discussion about this with a friend the other day. We were, we were taking a walk, and he, he was saying, you're too balanced when you bring up politics during these interviews. I mean, there really is a more compassionate, you know, uh, progressive wing of, of the political spectrum and, and another which is, you know, rather hard-hearted and, and repressive, and, and you should, um, you know, mention that. But um, Yeah, you know, I, I have a metaphysical background, and, and having that background, I tend to see things as um, old souls, young souls. Mm. You know, this is this is, this Earth is like a schoolroom, one room schoolroom with all different age souls in it. And they have different points of view. And from their perspective, it makes total sense to them. And it is part of their evolution to see things that way. And it, it makes the wheels go around in this world. <laughs> it creates the, 
the conflict and the, and the growth and, and all of that. So there's a, a place for it, but I do think that, um, that compassion is a sign of a more advanced consciousness and love and um, the willingness to take care of others, to see the world as one family and reach out and um, create a society that supports individuals, even the weakest. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, cer it certainly is a very Christian thing to do. Yeah, it is. Okay, so where were we? History, my we're history. Going, we're, yeah, we can. Let's do a little bit more of that, and then I'm sure we'll diverge again. Okay. Okay. So. Um, when you started well, getting into the Eastern things when you were in college, um, in what sense did you do that? Did you learn meditation? Did you t visit a guru? How, how did you glom on to the Eastern um, knowledge? Well, a really funny thing happened. As n not much farther into Eastern things, um, I got involved with uh, some c Catholic priests who were psychic and mystical. Mm. And then I began to go to mass at five o'clock every morning, <laughs> and I it just was so deeply. It, it just was such a deep experience for me, and so it was very odd to find it again within the Catholic Church. And it's not that I ever went back to the Catholic Church that I had known as a child but to discover that there is an esoteric side, a mystical side, to, the, to Catholicism and, of course, to many other religions, Sufism in, you know, in Islam, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there is that side, and so I was happy to find uh, those people, and then I got more interested in psychic kinds of things because um, this person could see auras, this priest could see auras, and, I found that so fascinating, and of course, I wanted to see auras. So I started reading about psychic things, and you know, I was very young. It's um, uh, you know nat natural at that age to be interested in that kind of glamour, and I, I I was meditating a little bit, but that really my spirituality until I was much more mature, my spirituality was what I would say is kind of typical of New Age spirituality. It was about getting a better me. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted, you know, to be happy. I wanted to not suffer. And a lot of the New Age technologies helped with that. Um, so, but anyhow, it was rather short-lived, the interest in metaphysics or the interest in Eastern religions. And that, that period of my, my life, sort of quickly got swallowed up by getting married and moving back home to a more conventional atmosphere. And my husband at the time was working for his father. And oh, we just dropped all of our spirituality at that time. And I missed it. And that when the time I was married to him, it just didn't really, wasn't really prominent. And then, about 10 years later, I started reading Carlos Castanadas. Mm. And I was having an entire uh, shift again spiritually where I, I just was so unhappy with my life. And I just wanted more. And I wanted to see what I could do, what I could create, because I'd been living my husband's dream. And so I left that marriage. And I. Um, um, got a master's degree in psychology, started studying astrology because I wanted to be a really good astrological counselor, which is why I went to, um, uh, to study astrology. And so then I really poured myself into the study of psychology and metaphysics. But the most significant thing was in, happened in 1986, which all of a sudden, one day, I realized that um, when I asked a question mentally, I got an answer clear as a bell in my mind. And it was a wise answer. And so I asked another question and another and another. And I, I just couldn't believe that I was able to communicate so easily with something that was beyond myself. Mm -hmm. 
And Are you sure it was beyond yourself, or could it have been within yourself, some deeper level of yourself? Well, there's a tonality in voice mm -hmm. that comes through. There's a not so much of a personality, but there's a feel, an energy that's attached to the, to the mental voice that, to me, is clearly not mine. Uh -huh. And so um, it never was a question to me whether it was within me. It just was very, besides, I, I believe there were beings in other dimensions. I, I've always felt that. I've always, I don't know, it just, it, beyond a belief, it's just something I always knew in my heart was, was true. And so then that experience of beginning to, to channel, because that's really what it was, it's a conscious channeling, I could, I could have that kind of communication in the shower, walking around, doing anything. I didn't have to sit and meditate or be quiet or do anything I, to make that happen. It just was as simple as could be, and it, it always has been since then. It's never changed. But, Did you sit there for an hour and give a whole lecture uh, dictating what this voice was telling you, or was it more like little snippets? No, yes, I do that all the time. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, what, but what happened though in in 1986, the first year that my channel opened up, opened up, I wasn't grounded enough to reach higher level beings all the time, mm -hmm. and so I started getting some little lessons. I started getting tricked by astral beings mm -hmm. who um, wanted to tell me what to do and tell me the future and all the things, feed my ego, mm -hmm. tell me all the things I really wanted to know as an ego. And, and um, I also wanted to be told what to do at the time because being a Pisces, that was my dream come true. Tell me what choice to make, tell me what to do. And How did so you know I, they were astral beings, um, just different voice uh, or because they sort of give you wrong advice or yes at, yeah. at the time I didn't at the time I couldn't discriminate between the higher level beings I was talking to sometimes and lower astral beings that I was talking to so it was very confusing and very tricky because I was getting um, wisdom much of the time and then there would be um, wrong stuff there, there would be inappropriate meddling in my affairs which I allowed, you know, I gave my power away because that was my lesson. Yeah. And I gave my power away to one too many times and realized at a certain point that I am way too gullible to do this. So I stopped channeling after a really bad experience that first year. Ultimately, it culminated in a bad experience. Do, and do I you, said, do, would it be interesting to hear that what that was or would you rather not go into it? Um, <clears throat> I can, I can tell you just very, very, um, yeah, uh, okay, this is, it, it's, um, it was one of the worst things that ever happened to me, really, because it was devastating to me, because I was very involved with getting information, and learning, and growing, and getting wisdom, so it was very devastating to realize that I had been also deceived. And so um, um, I, I had been told some things that, uh, and I don't want to really go into that, but I had been told some things that were in, inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And I would made some choices that were pretty critical choices in my life based on that information. And then I discovered that I had made these changes in my life based on false information. And um, it was, it, it, and it, uh, it was problematic for me in my life. Uh, as a matter of fact, I quit a job because of it. And, uh, and it was a very big mistake to do that. And so I was devastated when I discovered this. And then when I discovered it, I confronted the astral beings. And the astral beings start, they, I could hear a group of them. I could actually hear a group of them all like laughing huh. and my my channel at that time was blown so open hmm. it was blown so open that I couldn't shut it and I couldn't close off the sound of their voices 
and they started telling me that I should commit suicide. Interesting. You know, I was going to ask you whether they were malicious or just yeah. stu just stupid, but it sounds like you just answered that question. They they became extremely malicious once found out, mm. and um, so and and I'm and I'm sharing this because it might be enlightening for people who have gotten involved, whether they they even knew they they have a channel or not. Some people get voices in their head that are so demonic that right. aren't them, they aren't part of them. And, and it is possible for demonic voices to, to come into a person's mind and tell them to commit suicide. There's nothing more they would love to do than to have that power to, to, to do that to a human being. They like that. So there is that level of negative entities in the in the in existence yeah. that 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 find pleasure in doing that and so here i am um channel blown open can't quiet them down and so i go to a shamanic healer friend of mine a good friend of mine and he said come stay with me and i'll and i'll help you you know close your channel and it just did close um, over in the course of a day or so it just did and so fortunately I was able to close it down and I was able to just um, get grounded again but it was a very harrowing experience and did you shut I, out the wise one too or just yes the, absolutely shut I out just, everybody yeah I was not I did not want anything to do with that hmm. I just knew I was not ready for this I wasn't yeah. ready and that had shown me but you know what, when you have an experience like that, it changes you. Yeah. And um, I, I, it was a very powerful learning for me. But what, what happened next is well, that... Let me uh, just interject to say mm -hmm. that, you know, some people listening to this are going to say, well, she, just, she was just crazy. I mean, you don't, there, aren't no, there are no beings. It was just her, you know, her biochemistry was haywire or, or, you know, she was just kind of mentally unbalanced or something and somehow or other and I don't think we can address uh, that level of skepticism in, in this interview um, but well, I was a perfect I'm a, a perfectly functioning human being who's you know so this was the fact I was choosing I was choosing to communicate with these beings good or bad yeah. whereas people who have schizophrenia or who hear voices there it isn't a choice Right, it just and dominates them. It it dominates them. But it it, it started to dominate you until you decided yeah. you, be, you better shut it down. Yeah, for about yeah. two days. For right. about two days, it was it 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 overwhelmed me, mm -hmm. and uh, so then an interesting thing happened. Uh, a friend of mine said, "Oh, you should call so and so. He's he's a healer, and he can help you." close your channel and this was before it was entirely closed and I called him and he didn't happen to be home and then he called me back a week later after my channel was already closed and I ta had this wonderful conversation on the phone with him and he said well why don't we meet for lunch and we did and I fell in love with him and we <laughs> immediately moved in together <laughs> <laughs> and I started um, working with him he was an energy healer and he was clairsentient also he could feel in your body where your energy blocks were mm -hmm. and I began to work regularly with him and that's when I began a really serious practice of meditation mm -hmm. and I used to meditate uh, about two hours a day then mm -hmm. and so for the next two years um, I did a lot of personal work, healing work, you know, clearing of emotional issues with this individual who I, I married after two years. And, and, um, and the meditation was very strong in that period for me. And so two years after this very negative experience, I'm sitting one day and I hear a voice, very respectful voice, say, may we speak to you? And I thought, huh, that's interesting. And I thought, well, if, as long as I don't, I, 
as long as I'm discriminating or I don't listen to personal information, I guess I could see what there is here to, to, to find out. So I began to communicate with this particular being. And it was all informational about the world, about transformation of consciousness that's happening on the Earth. Um, about the infusion of beings from higher dimensions coming here and that kind of thing. And so the, the purpose of the information that I was given was to help ease the way on the planet, to help raise consciousness. And so um, he continued to, um, I continued to have a relationship with this particular individual. And from that point on, I never spoke to another being except this individual. Mm. And it seems, and it was always clear to me that it was this individual because there's a certain experience, tonality, energy. And so Does this individual been, have a name? Um, well, he gave me a name at the time to use. And of course, they don't have names because they have energies, and they right. recognize each other by energies. But the name he gave me at the time was Theodore, oh. and Theodore or Theo. So that's what I've called him from the sixth dimension. Mm -hmm. And so, so I hang, hang on. He's from the sixth dimension. So wait a minute. We have, we have <laughs> <laughs> how many? We, we have four dimensions in our in our ordinary world, right? Um, the fourth dimension is the astral plane. Oh, wait, wait I'm, I'm mixed up. I thought fourth was time. So the fourth dimension is the astral plane. Okay, yeah. fifth, fifth is? The, the fifth is the, higher, is the higher astral, where, the, where spirit guides, mm -hmm. where guides for individuals reside. Mm -hmm. And the sixth dimension is where guides for Earth reside. For the whole planet. Yeah, for the whole planet. And so, there's some above that? Um, Sure, presumably there are guides for, hmm. for the sixth dimension. I, I, I'm not sure what goes on beyond that, but right. it seems that uh, Theo and I have some kind of a maybe agreement to do work together in this lifetime to bring through information and understanding that's helpful at this time. Hmm. And initially in the 1990s, um, the information I brought through was more New Age, like what we've been talking about, this metaphysical and um, transformation of consciousness on the planet. It was more like what a lot of channels have brought through. And um, also, um, I've been helped with my astrology. Um, the, this being is always with me, always blended with me, mm -hmm. and more and more so as time has gone on. And so we're like, um, we're like a fused pair. And right now, me speaking to you is, you know, I can't tell if it's me speaking to you or us speaking to you or, or them speaking to you or, you know, I, I don't know what the, di I mean, I, I can tell the difference. If I'm in my ego, I know it's not, I know it's not uh, that fused energy. Mm -hmm. But, um, other than that, um, this, this sense of being connected with this being is a sense of presence. It's a sense of being connected to who I am. So it's kind of interesting because I, when I awoke, uh, I knew myself as what I experienced in meditation and what I experienced, I could say, when I'm channeling. Mm -hmm. And so... And it's all very mysterious, isn't it? Yeah. I just want to say to the strict non-dualists who may be listening, hang in there with us because we're going to discuss, you know, the doubts that you probably are having in your mind about, you know, from your perspective as uh, a strict non-dualist, you know, there is no no one home and, and so on and so forth, no person, no choice. And, and, and the whole discussion of entities on different levels sounds alien to you, um, but we're going to we're going to juxtapose that or I mean, we're going to sort of investigate that and hopefully resolve some of the um, issues that come up around that kind of thing in sort of non-dual circles yeah it it never seemed to be a conflict to me to include other dimensions non-physical beings in in this reality because um, 
because my experience and the experience of many other people who have six, six senses, mm -hmm. who are able to see beings, I can speak to them, but people can see them. To me, that there are beings who exist in other dimensions is, is, a, is a given, is pretty obvious. And so they are also evolving. They are also involved with physical dimensions and helping us on this, on this plan, plane. And when we evolve beyond this, we'll be helping others in other forms too. So um, why isn't it possible for this oneness to manifest as physical and non-physical beings? Or to manifest know. a universe that evolves from physicality to non-physicality? I don't have a problem with it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, for instance, you know, Tony Parsons, for instance, is fond of saying that everything is just, you know, he says this is being is just walling or being is, you know, carring or whatever. In other words, everything that we see is a just a, a manifestation in a sort of a dream like state of the same essential substance. And that, I'm cool with that. But if yeah. that if that is true, then and we see how utterly diverse the universe is, you know, even here on, on this planet, we'll go watch the Discovery Channel and look at how incredibly creative and diverse nature is. Um, then why can't there be subtler realms, which we don't necessarily perceive with our gross senses, but which are just as real, if, if we want to attribute reality to anything, as the concrete stuff, you know, um, cars and trees. Uh, I mean, you know, and that opens up a whole world of possibility. And if we have any respect for traditional knowledge, virtually every tradition talks about this stuff. I mean, the, the Vedic tradition, which is really the source of Vedanta, the source of non-dualism as it's popularized in the West, is, uh, is just replete with discussions of, there's, there's categorizations of all the different types of beings that exist on different levels and descriptions of them and all kinds of stories about people interacting with them and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, and the, the founder of non-dualism, Shankara, probably would, you know, he would have said, well, ultimately the world is Brahman, he did say that, but he probably wouldn't have disputed the legitimacy of those other scriptures which discuss all that stuff. Uh, Vedanta is the end of the Veda. Yeah, that's what it means, and that doesn't. It doesn't. Um, and, and there's a saying in the in the Gita, you know, for the enlightened Brahman, all the Vedas are of no more use than as a small well in a place flooded with water on every side. Uh, but that doesn't mean that all the other Vedas and all the other spiritual literature, and we don't even have to stick to the Indian, we can go to all the traditions, are invalid just because there's a sort of a pinnacle to it all. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of stuff as you go up the mountain. Yeah, it, it's such a big mystery. And I think what you, how you described Tony Parsons' philosophy about the oneness and being and everything, and that, that isn't contradictory to no. what I'm saying. And so I, I think that, you know, we're trying to put into words this great mystery but, um, you know, and, and each, each of us maybe speak, speaks a, a part of, of the truth. Mm -hmm. But um, it's... You know that saying, netty, netty, not this, not this? Um, yes. If, if I, I, I'd like to find out the Sanskrit for the opposite of that, which would be this, this, which is, <laughs> you know, which is the way I kind of go about it, which is yes. not to reject everything, but to say, okay, yes, this is also true, and this is also true, and this is also true. Yeah. And the, tru the truths may be paradoxical to one another, but each one yeah. is a facet in a much larger you know, gem than, than people ordinarily uh, in, in encapsulate. Yeah, and you know, I, to me, what's important is, is um, what, what's true is that the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in, does, does the wisdom or the truth or the belief that you have, is it working for you? Yeah. It, does it bring you closer to love? And that's what I mean by working for you, really, is does it bring you closer to love? And that's my measure. And if my experience with a being from another dimension 
did not improve my life and the lives of others, and I don't just mean my story, my life, but in, in help evolve me and others, move us forward towards greater love, unity, and the experience of oneness, well, I wouldn't be interested in it at all right. because I am interested in the truth more than anything. I've, and it, it, I used to be interested in getting a better me, but mm -hmm. I grew up. I, I matured. My spirituality matured, and I, I became more interested in the truth. And, and the good news is that the truth is that love and goodness is behind all of it. And I've always known that. I've always had this core of goodness that I was connected to, that I honored, that I loved, that I loved myself for, that I loved others for, that I saw in others. And that's the, that's the truth. And anything, any belief or idea about the about the truth or philosophy that brings brings you in touch with that goodness, with that God within, with that love within you, is I say that's the right direction. And so um, I think anything can serve. Astrology has served me in counseling other people. It's helped to give people a bigger perspective than their ego's perspective and help them move into what I call the place of essence. So if metaphysics can be used to help people um, see that they are God, see that they are goodness, that they are love, then more power to it, then use it. And if, it, if it's getting in the way of that, then throw it out. Yeah, well even if we don't regard some of these things uh as being the ultimate truth or the ultimate reality, even if we regard them as being sort of relatively real but not ultimately real, then, you know, it takes a thorn to remove a thorn. Um, you know, at, at some point you cast away the thorn, but the thorn can be useful um, to remove other thorns. <laughs> and that's a common saying. Ramana Maharshi used to say that and very, various predecessors of his. Yeah, absolutely whatever works. And so when we're meeting people who are lost in their ego, we have to find a way to, to touch them, to help move them out. And sometimes it might be the truth that Tony Parsons speaks. It might be that very thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it won't be that. It'll be something else. And the good teacher, the best teacher, the best counselor will be someone who is able to intuitively know what to say. And when I say intuitively, really what I'm talking about is being connected to essence, to the awareness, the presence, the love, the oneness that we are. Because we are that beingness, that's, that's who we are. We are, the, we are the beingness incarnate. And when the ego gets moved out of the way, we can begin to speak as that and move as that. And that's mm -hmm. the whole purpose. It's not to wake up and get out of the world so you don't have to mess with those nasty little egos and you're all free and you're done with it. That, you know, that's not the point. The point is that God must want to be here. The mm -hmm. divine must want to be here because look what it created. And it's wanting to wake up in this beautiful creation and to live as the individual that we're meant to be within this creation. So I do also feel that we all have an individual purpose, that a, a certain life, a certain destiny, you could say, that has lots of wiggle room for our, us to create, to co-create with the divine. But we each are, are set to have a certain kind of destiny. Maybe it's to be a teacher, or maybe it's to be the be a, a wonderful mother, or to be a politician. And so this is one thing I get from the astrology. It seems very clear to me. Um, astrology is this wonderful tool that gives you a description to some extent of the life purpose, of the lessons, of the difficulties, and of the timing of the unfolding of the life purpose and the life work and what can get in the way of it and what kind of karma you might have and that kind of thing. All of this can be very helpful 
to guide a person along the way. And that guidance is always meant to just keep pointing them to the, the, the bigger picture of who they are and um, away from the small character or ego, especially the ego that they are. The character is still always there, even when we wake up, right? Yeah. I'm on uh, Eckhart Tolle's email list, uh, and he sends out these little present moment reminders you know, mm. every, every week or so. And there's one that came this week in which he said, ultimately, he said, we're not a person. We're a focal point through which the universe can be aware of itself. And I, I thought of our conversation that, we'll, that, we might, that we would have when I read that. And I thought to perhaps take it another step. And I bring it up now because I think it's germane to what you were just saying, which is that the universe ultimately is a focal point through which consciousness can know itself. So you can take it. Uh, it's not that the, the universe is knowing itself. It's that consciousness is knowing itself through the instrumentality of the universe, which contains trillions of focal points, mm -hmm. if we want to sort of see it in a particulate way rather than as a whole. And you know, each of us is one of those focal points. We're each sort of a sense organ of the, in, of the infinite. And as you say, each sense organ is different. Each sense organ serves a different function, different purpose, has a different role to play, a different dharma. Um, so, anyway. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that description. It's exactly how I feel about life, how I experience it. And when you are in that place of experiencing it that way, it is so delightful. It's so beautiful. And this, this place of being very present is a place of just seeing beauty in everything and seeing the rightness of all of it. Mm -hmm. And so whatever experience we're having is really the right experience for that point in time. And then it always shifts and changes. And it's such a great, it's such a great dance. Yeah. And, and I think one of the, one of the things I, I wanted to say in this interview it, because so many people ask me questions that seem to assume that after you're awake, everything is so wonderful and you must be so like perfect and happy all the time and that kind of thing. And what I, what I really want to say is that everybody, wherever they're at in their consciousness right now in this moment, is exactly where they need to be. It's exactly the right place. And I came to see this because, um, you know, I write a lot about the ego. And if I didn't still have an ego to the level that I have it, I would probably not write about it. I would not be that interested in it. And I think it's very helpful the way I write about it. It's helpful for people who have egos it helps them move out of the ego to understand it, to know its tricks and what it's up to. And if I didn't still have it, I, how could I write book after book after book about it? I must be very fascinated by it. I'm, I am interested in it. I'm interested in helping people with that. And my particular niche of consciousness, whatever that is, however deep or undeep it is, it's exactly the right place to do the work I came here to do. And I would say that your consciousness also is in exactly the right place to do this work, which I'm sure is very much a part of your soul's desire, your deepest soul's plan. And, and so we all are in exactly the right place and the whole timing of our unfoldment, there is a perfect timing of it. There is an intelligence that is that is in control of the unfolding of each of our lives and it's doing it beautifully and so we can't hurry it and that that's called grace right it's grace is unfolding it and it comes um, as an awakening moment when it's time for that and no sooner no later and there still is some place for spiritual practice sure and some place for free will in there well, you know, you don't help a flower blossom any sooner by breaking the bud open and <laughs> to see how it's doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this whole thing about ego, yeah. it, you know, there are some spiritual teachers who say, well, there couldn't be re reincarnation and there couldn't be karma and so on because that implies the existence of a person or an entity to who would reincarnate or who would receive the karma and so on. But think about it this way. I mean, 
if even if we acknowledge, which you know, all of the great teachers have said, that ultimately the world is a dream, and that ultimately all of this can be boiled down to its essence as you know, pure non-dual oneness. Uh, nonetheless, we have apparently a body which has you know all, all sorts of intricate mechanisms in it. We have apparently an intellect, apparently senses, apparently in the, a mind. All these are just faculties through which we function in this so-called dream world. So why not also apparently an ego, you know, some identity which um, ultimately isn't real, but which in is, real, is as real as anything else is, as one of the faculties which enable us to function. Yeah, and the ego, it was programmed into the human being. Yeah, like it's, your like your nose, <laughs> or yeah. whatever. You know. It's part of it. Without the ego, we wouldn't experience ourselves as separate. So. In order to create this illusion, the, the divine had to create something that would make it seem like we're separate yeah. when we aren't. And well, having said it, that, of course, people have these radical non-dual realizations and they feel like they can't even find any shred of ego left. It's been blown away. There's a sense of a profound sense of impersonality. Yes, but they still answer when their name is called. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. they still do have the level of ego that's necessary to function as a separate human being. Mm -hmm. But you don't need the egoic mind. You don't need that chattering in the mind, that commentary that is so constant in the human condition which causes suffering. You don't need the egoic mind. You may need an ego to some extent to continue having a sense of individuality and function as an individual but you don't need the commentary in your mind to function and that's what they discover yeah let's let's talk about your awakening that happened in the late 90s and then let's use that as a uh, springboard for talking about functioning in the egoic mind versus functioning free of it okay well um, in 1999 I was a new age teacher and I I was counseling and I just felt that there was too much ego still and I started to withdraw from my work some because I just knew there was something missing and in a sense um, I don't think I could put it into words at the time but I I felt I needed a teacher and there was such a synchronistic funny way that I ended up encountering Adyashanti um, I had been to a few other non-dual teachers before, like Gangaji, but there were three, three or four hundred people in the room, and and as wonderful as she is, I just felt this isn't my teacher. She can't be my teacher, and um, so just on a, it was just a very strange occurrence that Ajashanti came up to Santa Rosa, and did a very small satsang there with only six people in the room. And my boyfriend at the time, he said, um, oh, this guy named Ajashanti is, is going to be talking on Sunday morning. You want to go, go? And I said, oh, OK, sure. And God, I was there then. I wish I'd known about it. I was, I was visiting uh, in-laws in Guerneville, so I could have easily <laughs> come over then. But oh, that's, I didn't oh, know that's any so about funny. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And there was something about sitting in this room, six people, this very unassuming young man, a um, young, little younger than me, um, he just said, you can awaken, and if anyone can awaken. And that was very powerful for me. That was a very powerful message. He also pointed out that New Age seeking was seeking a better me, and it wasn't transcendent of the me. And of course, I guess I must have encountered that message before, but I wasn't ready to hear it. I wasn't really ready. You know, it takes a certain readiness to decide that you want to move beyond that me. And I was like a ripe fruit at the time. And then I, after that satsang, I signed up for, oh, my boyfriend and I immediately broke up after that satsang. <clears throat> it was so funny. And we both went on the retreat. About two weeks later, we went on a retreat together. <laughs> With Ajashanti? And with Ajashanti, right. Mm -hmm. And um, But I had already just moved on, and I 
about another month later, I was at a satsang with someone named Vartman. He was in Australia. Oh, I've heard of him. Yeah, sure. He's on yeah. my list. And we, we were doing a, a dyad of where we broke up into two people, you know, and a dyad is two people. <laughs> and we asked each other the question, who am I? Right? Is this just part of the workshop? And when I was sitting there across from this other person, um, it just suddenly, my identity shifted. It just dropped out of this place that I'd been living in and moved into another place, the, a place I was familiar with from when I channeled, from when I meditated. And the room also filled up with light, golden light. And I said something to her that she totally didn't get. I mean, I was on such a different wavelength that I must have been, it was sort of a crazy interaction, but it didn't last very long anyhow. And then I went home from that, and, and I just couldn't think a thought for five days. It just, there just was no thought coming into my mind. And that was so surprising. Nothing. Nothing. Just so no like, as you were making dinner and stuff, just, there wouldn't be a, okay, I'll now go get the knife or something. It would just Nothing. be complete spontaneous action without any apparent yeah. mental activity. Yeah. Okay. It was so, it was, it was just so surprising. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy. Didn't have any songs and going through your head. <laughs> <laughs> any like, you know, how, what should I wear tonight? What should I, what should I, should, do I need any vegetables? Should I go to the market? None of that. <laughs> nothing. Okay. Nothing. It was just, it was very strange. And then the mind slowly came back. But then you're on to it. You're, fr you're so much in this deeper place that the mind is seen differently. It's just, it's seen as separate from you, as not a part of you, as if it is just some distant, distant voice. And so it wasn't very hard to not get involved in it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that over time, it comes back to some extent, and then if there is some emotion triggered it it's there and conditioning's triggered so after that five days it came back to some extent but it's never the same and so i've never had this experience that some people talk about as lost it found it found it lost it um right, right. i uh something shifted in that moment in time it was permanent and it was clear to me so i never had a question was that it or wasn't that it? Now, I know so, some people do, and I think it can happen that way, but for me, it was always very clear to me. And then I moved into a, a phase of a, a honeymoon period, and of course, th there, wa uh, there was a lot of happiness over having awakened. And yeah. then there, there's the next, the next little trap, right, is I'm awake, whoopee! <laughs> Got your merit badge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and I think that is the next difficult, the next phase in awakening is that then you feel there's a certain ecstasy or happiness that is just the ego going, woohoo, you know, I, I achieved something here. Yeah, I'm taking this little course with Adya right now on, on the internet, this Wednesday night course for four weeks, and he's talking about the spiritual traps, and that's definitely one of them is like, Oh, aren't I special? I am awake now. Isn't this cool? It's something, yeah. you know, the ego kind of tries to creep back in and appropriate it. Yeah, and it's also just such a normal phase. I, maybe, maybe most people have to go through that. I, I hesitate to say everyone. Maybe everyone doesn't have to, but I would be surprised if most people didn't go through that. And um, so I... That, that whole first year was pretty wonderful. And it was also colored by the fact that I met Nirmala two weeks later. Oh, good. Yeah, two weeks later, I was at a satsang with him, and I met him. And then um, two weeks after that, we were both at an Ajashanti uh, day long, day long. And he was sitting behind me. And I remember him, and he remembered me from having met each other. And during the break, we all got up, and I turned around, and 
And he gave me a big hug, you know, saying hello. And I thought, oh, hmm. And then I sat down again, and I could just feel him behind me. And I wasn't even at satsang to look for somebody. I really wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I could feel him behind me, and I thought, hmm, that hug felt really good. Hmm, what's up? (laughs) Yeah, right. And then there was another break and another break, and we just kept hugging each other. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> He's great. a huggy person. Yeah. And, um, and then I emailed him afterwards, and I said, can we meet sometime? <laughs> yeah. And so then we spent a little time together. And then he went off traveling, and I didn't see him again. So this was that, so this, there was about four, four months when we just talked on the phone, and I was falling in love with him. So here we have the honeymoon of awakening, Plus, my own little personal honeymoon thing going mm. on with this man I'm falling in love with. It was a pretty good year, you could say. Yeah, like little yeah. swarms of cupids flying all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> but I'll tell you one, one more thing that happened this year that wasn't so, so great in this first year. And it goes along with what Ajishanti talks, has, has mentioned also as sometimes what can accompany awakening is uh, shortly after I, in this, I was... Um, I, I had a lot of energy, so I was exercising more than usual. Mm-hmm. I was running up and down these mountains in Santa Rosa. Mm-hmm. I love that this, there's this mountain with a lake on top. Mm-hmm. I'd run up to the top and run down, running on these rocks. I was doing sit-ups, just more than I was used to doing. And I, I got into this pattern of back spasms, and oh, you know, yeah. where my, ba- I, my back went out. Right. And it, it was so severe that for about three months I could barely take care of myself mm. and, I, and I was in constant pain and it was horrible and um, Nirmala came at the end of that four months he finally came to see me because on the phone we, we finally said well I think we need to see each other <laughs> because, and, and uh, so he said okay I'm going to be in California so I'll come and visit you so this was the first time we'd seen each other after four months, and I, you know, he didn't even remember what I looked like anymore. So he had to see me. He says, "Gosh, you know, I better You're practically check." Practically paralyzed at this point. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, he showed up at my door, and he told me about how back pain can be stored anger, hmm. because he was a massage therapist in the past, and he had read this book. Dr. John, John Sarno wrote about um, things like back pain and um, other kinds of, of pain can be caused by the body storing emotion instead in its, and then you need to tell your body not to store that emotion. So I read the book. By the time I was done with the book, my body, I was getting better, and I, I was able, I, I recovered within two weeks of finishing that book, but I also did some work on anger mm-hmm. then, and I, I did some inner work, and I recognized what that anger was about, and I did some releasing work on it, and so it goes along with what Aja has said about how after awakening there can be conditioning that comes up big time that needs to be released and it can manifest as physical issues. And I didn't even make that connection at the time, I'm not sure I understood that, but I, I think that it does fall into that category because it does seem emotionally based. You know, I was going to ask you before you started talking about this, whether since that awakening in 99, um, you had encountered any really serious, challenging, difficult situations, and whether that had perturbed the awakening or overshadowed it or something like that. So um, we'll t- we can talk in a minute about the, the need to do some house cleaning after awakening, but in terms of, um, you know, when you were in the throes of that back pain, when it, when it was at its worst, uh, was there any, was there still that sense of um, inner awakening, or, or was it sort of so beleaguered that you lost it or appeared to lose it? No, I was. I no, I didn't feel that I lost it. It okay. it was so and it's quiet, still inner kind of wakefulness in the despite the pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the fears, you know, the fears coming up. I noticed that. You know, I noticed the fears. Noticed 
notice what's going on, but I wasn't, I never lost that sense of brightness, awakeness that, that came with that. Yeah, and so how would that be different than if the same thing had happened to you before awakening? Um, well, I think I would have, um, I think I would have been openly angry mm -hmm. and feeling victimized. Yeah, that's the one. That's what, that's what I like to go to. That's, that's what I used to like to go to, victimization. I would have felt, oh, poor me. I would have been crying, angry. Um, so there would have been a sort of a small self-obsession. Yeah, I would have uh, felt powerless and weak and vulnerable. Powerless. Yeah. Whereas yeah. after awakening, not to put words in your mouth, was it more like um, the sense of personal self was more dissolved or diffused, or, or in addition to the sense of personal self, there was sort of an impersonal, which simply wasn't touched by all the difficulties that you were going through? That whole sense of what I was like before, mm -hmm. how how I was in the world, um, I couldn't find that same me anymore. It's yeah. like I, it, my, my self-image has changed, you could say. It was like that. It was, I didn't have the same self-images anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think probably I took on self-image of I'm awake, mm. too. And that's a lot happier one. <laughs> so there was probably that mixed in there and so I, I wonder if it's how possible it is to hold no image at all because um, I, I experience myself as no image but it's very insidious those images and I think there are unconscious self images that we hold and I certainly have been I think in the process of waking up out of a self-image of me as a spiritual teacher. Uh -huh. That's a big one. That's, how do you not take that on? You know, it's, it's hard. Other people see you as that. You have to, you present yourself as that. So there is a certain level of taking that on. And, but I think, I think it, what it, the key is, is how tightly you hold that or how lightly you hold that. You know, and so it's, holding all self-images lighter yeah. and, know, and being aware of the self-images that you are holding because once you're aware of the images that you're holding then in a sense you're not holding them so tightly so I think it always requires a certain investigation of where I might be holding an image when, when I'm not even realizing I'm holding an image mm -hmm. you know it could be a, holding an image of I'm nobody you know there's an image you know right Right. I, I mean, it, it, the mind is always landing somewhere. The, you know, it's, there's, there's always something going on. And being aware of it and holding it all lightly is, I think, the key and the best, thing, best we can do with it all. Yeah, interesting. I'm kind of reminded of my own case where in my 20s I was, you know, giving all these lectures on meditation and traveling around and speaking to 500 people and teaching courses and all this stuff. And then, you know, because I was in a spiritual organization that would shuffle people around from this, that, and the other to, to different things, you know, next thing I would find myself cleaning toilets and shoveling cow manure and building fences and stuff. And it was really kind of good to swing back and forth between those those kinds of um, roles to, to, you know, de-inflate any sort of s sense of, uh, you know, being the, the great teacher or anything. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. still, cl I, st I still clean toilets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we let's talk about, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say that in our ordinary life, we're, we're so ordinary. You know, you can't, you don't carry around that image of spiritual teacher in your ordinary life. No. Nope. It's so, you know, the thing about awakening is what you discover is that this, it's so ordinary. The yeah. experience of your beingness is the most ordinary thing and it's been with you all your life. And there's nothing special about it at all. And as Ramdas says, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a week with your parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll deflate you. Um, so uh, let's talk a bit about 
the you did you did ask a good question there a, a minute ago if, if there was anything that had shifted me out of this yeah um, was it was it invincible or could it be overshadowed or or you know by the most trying of circumstances well i did have a, i did have an experience after that honeymoon period of moving into about a 5 year period of dryness and now what so what yeah flat and flat and i at that point after i awakened i stopped channeling mm -hmm. because i had no questions yeah and i also was influenced by adya's attitude towards new age things and thinking that it wasn't ne necessary or it served no purpose or somehow it 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 wasn't right or it didn't fit right so I actually stopped channeling for five years, mm -hmm. and that, and I did not. I just didn't even talk at all for mm -hmm. five years. That was amazing. And in those five years, it was very dry. It was, um, and that at that point, Nirmala and I had moved in together, and we'd moved to Arizona. But I just felt like, wow, I have no motivation to teach, or to write, or to do any of the things that I used to love to do and was so driven to do. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine what I had to say to anybody about any of this. Hmm. And I didn't know, I couldn't imagine where this was all going and what was going to happen. There was no future, no, you know, no sense of goals or future or any of that. Hmm. And so there was a part of me that wasn't happy about that. That's where the dryness comes in. It's like you have one foot in the the truth and one foot is still back in the old old way of being except that you can't find that old way of being anymore so it's like you're stuck in this limbo place yeah and do you know that place yes yes yeah mm -hmm. so um <clears throat> so it was hard and then one day nirmala said to me you know theodore was so helpful to you why don't you see if they have something to say about awakening? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, <laughs> sure enough, the words started flowing. <laughs> mm. and, I, and I haven't stopped since. So, um, so all of the writing and teaching that's come forth has been on a new, on a, in a new vein. It's come from the new, the new place that I've been living from and it's come through in a different way and Did you write all eight of your books since then or were some of them yes. before that oh really wow so yeah. you really become prolific yeah right it and so that that's I know that's what I'm here to do is be a writer that's yeah. what I do best and I like to talk as you can probably tell <laughs> I like to talk and teach, but I love to write. I love words, and I've enjoyed counseling too, but I, I've just set that aside recently. <clears throat> so do you feel like your books are largely kind of inspired by Theodore, or is it more like you said before, you really can't separate the two and just know which is coming from where? Well, they really are just given to me. And so I would, I, I do take credit for being the instrument mm -hmm. and for having the consciousness, the awareness, the knowledge base to be able to, to, to bring through that, that in the way it comes through. And so if I, I see, I couldn't have written these books, I couldn't have brought these books through before I had an awakening. Right. So so it is a it is a necessary thing for me to be I am part of it. I'm definitely part of the process. But you're it's the instrument. Just, I'm the instrument, but it's it is literally just given to me word for word, oh. nonstop flow from cover to cover and um, and That's I, great. And so I, you don't actually sit down and work out a whole logical structure and kind of agonize over it. It just flows right out of you, huh? I, I'm told what it's going to be about. I'm given a table of contents, hmm. and 
the introduction and boom, boom, boom. It is, it is that way. That's and great. My, yeah, everything I write is that way. And when I teach in my intensives, it's that way. Mm -hmm. I invite that my helpers, my helping presence, and open my mouth, and there it is, you know. So um, I, I've been trying to not call it channeling because that just seems to be so limiting, and it, it sends a lot of people away. So I've put that in the background, but I've never really tried to hide it from people. I've always been open that this is how it is for me, but I keep it in the background on my website because I, I want my books and all to reach as many people as possible. And I also like to say in defense of channeling, if you're not channeling something beyond this little you, this false you, then you're channeling your ego. <laughs> you know, if you're not channeling, I mean, I think that the, this phenomenon is more broad-based. It's pretty universal. Musicians channel music, artists channel art. Um, people who are operating at a high level are bringing something through from whatever you want to call it. And just yeah, because like, like I, we were saying earlier, I mean, George Lucas channeled Star Wars, you know? Yeah, just yeah. because I happen to have a name attached to it and happened to be called channeling, then it gets put in a certain category. And part of the problem it, with channeling is that, as I experienced early on, with some channeling, it does not all come from a higher level. And it's not all helpful. And, and not everyone is able to discriminate that. So that kind of gives it a bad name. It, it, you know, like anything else, it there are levels that are more valuable than others, but to throw out the whole thing just because not all of it is is true and good and worthy is is silly. You know, I and I also also often say, if anybody had the experience that I've had with this being, they would not turn their back on it. They would not walk away from it because it's such a blessing. I should say that your books are very enjoyable to read. I mean, I've read a little bit of channeled material from Ramtha and things like that, and my impression is, Jesus, this guy couldn't even pass a high school English exam. You know, why does he have to speak in such a convoluted, pretentious manner? You can't just, you know, be simple, well-written prose. And, you know, your books are written that way. I mean, they're very enjoyable, well-written, sensible. You don't get any sense of ooga booga, you know, moody kind of uh, verbiage in them. Yeah, that's why we've, we've fused. In a sense, Theodore learned to speak in a way that was more human. Yeah. And, learned to, and we learned to have a voice that is my voice. Right. We, we learned to put these things into a voice that is my voice. Mm -hmm. And so it, 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 and the words are given to me in my voice. And um, and I also am as equal a teacher of these things. So it's not that I'm just a channel who couldn't teach um, without this. It's just that the uh, my teaching was developed by being given all of this writing. Mm -hmm. It's like this is oh this is the body of knowledge I came to teach. And it feels so right. And it took me 60 years, Rick, to, <laughs> to find my niche, you know, to find yeah. my niche. Me too. And, it's, <laughs> and I know it's such a blessing, though. It's such a blessing. But whoever knew it would take that long, right? It's a good thing nobody said it was going to going to be that long. <laughs> well, I see life as a continuum, you know. So, I mean, yeah. if, I were, if I were to die tomorrow, it's just, uh, that's just a little little milestone, little mile marker on a much longer continuum. Right. So it's not, not a big deal. I don't feel like, oh dear, I'm 60 now and maybe I only have 20 years left and how can I, you know, there's no sense of that. It's just like an ongoing uh, adventure. Yeah. Uh, now, a minute ago you said um, if you're not speaking 
if you're not channeling somebody, you're speaking from your ego. So would you say that it's, it's really that black and white? It's really that either or? Well, I think that this body mind, which is programmed with an ego and also programmed with a personality, mm -hmm. can be used by the false self, the ego, or it can be used by essence, which I, is the word I use for the divine as it's expressing as an individual. And then I think it can go back and forth so quickly that it seems like a mixture. Mm -hmm. So in one second, your ego is kind of running, running it, and the next second, the essence comes forward. And yeah. so I and it can and, be more mature and integrated, so that the two are functioning harmoniously without any seesaw effect. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and and then the more um, the more realized we are, and the more we are familiar with living from essence, the more that just becomes the place we are primarily coming from and yeah but when you say channeling I mean you know then that that brings up I mean it's one thing most people would relate to this idea of speaking from essence and living in essence and operating from essence and so on but that's different than Theodore you know Theodore, yeah. Theodore is an individualized entity which um, like like we're individualized entities just yeah. maybe of a higher order and that's what I think of when I think of channeling. I think of sort of, you know, speaking for an individualized intelligence rather than just being reflective of cosmic intelligence. Yes, but when a being is highly evolved, then there's not a lot of difference between what they would say and what your own essence says. Yeah, because yeah. they're so fully em embodying that same essence. Yeah, and in fact, what I've come to understand is that, and other, other people have said this too, in fact, you mentioned this um, in one of your interviews, that um, beings like Theodore are, are intermediaries between the, the, the oneness and the more individualized form that we are. And so spirit guides and, and and higher dimensional beings are working with human beings through their intuition to help them fulfill their task in this world. So they are, they are uh, facilitating essence. So th these higher beings are facilitating our expression of essence. You know, there's a verse in the Vedas, I don't know the Sanskrit, but the English is, the riches seek out him who is awake. And the riches means the verses of the Veda, actually, but those are understood to be uh, impulses of intelligence, which are the sort of fundamental seed imp impulses, which ultimately give rise to the whole universe. And so it's said that the, those impulses of intelligence seek out him who is awake. And I don't know what all the implications of that are, but what you've been saying reminds me of that. And when you think about it, <coughs> excuse me, when you think about it, if, if we are that sort of cosmic intelligence, which we are, essence if you want to call it, then, you know, Theodore and the riches and the devatas and everything else are all contained within what we really are. And, uh, you know, we are just, we as Gina or as Rick are just one individual expression of that, um, but we can, it seems, kind of operate in symphony with in collaboration with all these other impulses of intelligence if we're open enough to do it and not locked into our individual at, uh, individuality rigidly, so rigidly that we can't do it. Yes, we're, we are meant to express uh, the highest, the, the highest being, the being that we are. Mm -hmm. And the being is, it, it is coming through our particular body mind and our personality and and it has a certain mission and life purpose and so continuing to align with the the being means that we're going to move through life in a much uh, easier and more loving way and so the beings that we're that are working with us are just helping us facilitate our greatest possibility, our greatest potential 
to fulfill ourselves as the being that we are. And they're working to help heal any conditioning that is in the way, any egoic stuff that is in the way to speed along our evolution, our emotional evolution, our spiritual evolution. I think it's a beautiful, a beautiful picture of life. And the fact that some of us can speak and see, speak with, communicate with, and see individuals who acknowledge that that is what they're doing, I think it's a wonderful message, really. It, I, for me, it helped me feel connected, that, you know, that they're connected to something beyond. And of course, I know now that I'm connected to something beyond, because I am that, and I know that. But the people I talk to don't necessarily know that. And so it can be a very powerful message um, to speak about met these metaphysical realities. It can be very powerful for them to realize that they can, they can pray to or in, make an intention to, he to accept healing, to ask for healing from these individuals who are guiding our evolution. It's a very powerful act to do that. And so this is a very helpful message for people. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of coaches on a baseball team. Like, if you have, you have the third base coach, for instance, and he can see everything that's happening on the field. So if a guy gets a, a really good hit and he's, he's coming up to third base, the, the coach can tell him whether he should slide into third and stay there or go for home because he, the, the runner can't see that because he doesn't see the rest of the field. You know, he's, he's busy running. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but the coach can see it. He can give him a little uh, advice there that will make all the difference in the game. Yeah. I, don't even, I don't even have to explain the metaphor. It's yeah. so, such an obvious parallel. And when we as helpers or teachers, counselors, therapists, or whatever, are connected to, to the divine within us, then all of the helpers that are helping everyone involved work through us and deliver the information that's needed for that person's growth to unlock that key for them to move into essence. Mm -hmm. So... It, you know, it's so beautiful. We're here to be that instrument for essence. And um, I'm just more aware of what that instrument is connected to, you know, in, in the whole process of bringing through some information. The, my intuition is so strongly developed that I don't really even need to channel to know an answer or know what what would be said I just get it you know it just downloads into my body and then I say it so you know for instance when I do when I would do astrology readings I didn't need to channel I wasn't ostensibly channeling but I I would get downloads of oh yeah you have to say this 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 you know I just just was pushed to say something and I knew the truth of it by how it came out, how it felt when it came out. Mm. And so when you're very developed intuitively, you are literally a mouthpiece for what's wanting to come through. And so where does that all come from? What is that all about? I I you know, I call it I call it channeling, but you can you don't have to call it that. It's just it's just how it all works. We're all mouthpieces when we are aligned enough with that which which is our true nature. Mm -hmm. And when we also have developed our intuition enough, because I think it is also a tool that, and it, that gets developed through using it. Mm. In Sanskrit, it's called Ritambara Pragya, which means that level of intellect which knows only truth. I love how, how you have all these Sanskrit tool, uh, words <laughs> for, for everything. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm no scholar. These are just things I picked up over the years, mostly from Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. You know, he, he always talked about these different things. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about um, the house cleaning that took place with you and that seems to take place with a lot of people that took place with Adya, for instance, after an initial awakening. Um, I d and maybe I could preface, preface that by saying that with some people seem to accomplish a lot of that before their awakening, so there isn't a whole lot of fuss and bother after the awakening, but others not so much. And so, in a sense, you know, all hell can break loose after awakening when there's mm -hmm. a, a, a lot. But, it's all, but one way or the other, it's like nature isn't going to let you hold on to a lot of uh, garbage. It's got to be cleared out. 
I agree. I agree. And I did a lot of healing work. When, when I studied psychology, I was in therapy, I was studying my dreams, I did any number of different kinds of therapies, rebirthing, and all sorts of things that I tried, energy work, and besides regular psychotherapy, um, I studied Gestalt therapy. Uh, and then I, I also really have had this wonderful um, ability to dialogue with this inner teacher who has been like a therapist. So, and then I was married to that healer, as I said to you. Um, and so I've had a lot of help. And meditation has also been a very important part of my spiritual path. And I think I'm always advising that people do that because I really don't know how you can quiet that mind down enough without meditation to get a strong enough sense of who you really are. And so I, I think it's very important to do meditation and healing work. And I do think that laid the groundwork so that it was, I was able to just stay awake. Because I do think that, I think some people have an awakening and it's almost like they fall back to sleep if that's possible. It, it seem, they don't feel much different than when they weren't awake and they don't act much different and yet they had an awakening and I think that possibly the reason that happens is that they have their, their load of conditioning is still too heavy and it pulls them back into that same egoic space so I think a certain amount has to be cleared out so that you don't get pulled back and even so I still, there's still conditioning that um, I, I watch, I look at. It doesn't really, doesn't catch me up um, in this, it doesn't catch me up for long. It doesn't, you know, it, it's so different now. It's even hard to remember <laughs> what it was like, because this is 12 years ago. And um, when I talk to other people, who are still really caught up in their ego, I realize, in a sense, how far I've come. But the state that I live in is so ordinary and so easy to be in this state that I don't really think it's particularly unusual. And I don't, it isn't really, it's, it's ordinary. And, but it's more a matter of just noticing the thoughts and not being affected by them. And then if I do feel affected by them. Um, I either do some inquiry and look at it, or I just move on to something else. Because not all of my thoughts at this point need to be examined. They're not that sticky. If something's sticky enough to create feelings, then I think it needs to be examined. But if it doesn't create feelings, I just turn away from it. I just. <laughs> get busy with something else, you know, and noticing it, oh, there's that again, you know. Right. Uh-huh. But um, there, there were certain pieces, big chunks of conditioning that fell away after seeing them and seeing them and seeing them and seeing them a hundred million times. I don't know how many times, but that what happened after awakening. After awakening, because you have this perspective of of witnessing the mind from a distance. You have so much distance from the mind after awakening that it's easy to see the conditioning and it's easy then to, to um, heal it. Mm, the, the, trouble with, the trouble with before awakening is you're so close to it that it, you don't want to do the work because you just want to run away from it. You want to run away from your conditioning. But when you see that your thoughts are not your thoughts, then it's easier to say, oh, hello, okay, there you are, what's that all about? It's easier to be curious about it because it's not personal. And so that's, how, that's when it becomes so much easier to get rid, to, to chip away at your conditioning because you, you're not afraid of it. You don't mind it. It's like, oh, okay, I can look at you. And there's this verse in the Brahma Sutras which goes, the dweller of the house is seen far away in the distance. 
Ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, mine's, mine's a bad radio station. Uh-huh. <laughs> kind of not, not quite tuned in. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. I mean, it, it's almost like if there's mud to be dissolved, if you throw it in a glass of water, water gets muddied up right away. If you throw it in an ocean, you know, it just dissolves because the ocean has the capacity to dissolve it. <clears throat> so it's like we don't have the capacity to deal with, uh, to dissolve a lot of conditioning until a, a more oceanic kind of status has been realized. Yeah, I, I love that metaphor. Um, it's just that people are so upset with their conditioning. They hate that they're having their feelings. They hate that they're having their thoughts. And they just want to get rid of them. And that's the problem right there. Yeah, you create a ba an internal battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, the awakening just allows you to be easy with thoughts and feelings, yours and other people's. Yeah. And I think to a certain extent it can work both ways. I mean, a person can just culture the, the habit of being easier with things pre-awakening, you know, and being yeah. m more accepting of other people and being less rigid or dogmatic or whatever. And, and it, it's like, you know, the kind of stuff Byron Katie teaches people and helps people with and going through those steps of kind of re recognizing that your particular perspective is not absolute. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it definitely helps people to kind of shift into a more um, intuitive, uh, accepting kind of state. Yeah, I kind of see it like... Um Initially, you have to help people put a wedge between themselves and their thoughts. They need, need to just, if they can just take the tiniest step back, that's like the hugest step in the world, mm -hmm. to take the tiniest step back from your thoughts. Because a lot of people don't even know how to do that or haven't done that, you know? Once you learn to take a tiny step back, then you can take a little bit bigger step back and then it seems like you, you learn to increase that gap between a thought and reacting to a thought. That's really what the gap is about. It's like a, a thought comes up in your mind, and do you instantly identify with it, or do, do you see it for a second and then identify with it, or do you see it for five seconds and then identify with it, or do you not identify with it at all? Mm. It's all, it, it, there's all a matter of how big a gap you can allow between when a thought comes up and when you identify with it. Yeah. Because the bigger that gap is, the easier it is to not identify with it. And so that's what the spiritual progress is, isn't it? It's that gap getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, I was. I interviewed Karen Richards last week, and and um, she said a nice thing in one of her talks, which was that if you can catch a thought at an earlier stage of its development bec before it becomes so manifest, then there's more freedom, more sort of veto power, as it were, you know. Yeah. A and and you know, if we take that back even further, you know, if you can reside in that place which uh, exists before any thoughts arise, and if you can reside there consciously, mm -hmm. you know, then Theoretically, you would never be um, entrapped or overshadowed or identified with a thought. Yeah, you know, I experience thoughts sometimes as if they're like humming and like they're like like they're mumbling or muttering in the background. I, I, it's like I don't let them speak clearly. I, yeah. I just I I just keep them muttering in the background. I hear I hear that they're muttering. But I, I don't tune them in. You know, I don't tune into them to hear them clearly. And they I don't, don't give them an, you to action of any sort. Yeah, I don't give them enough tent attention that they come into focus. Right. Yeah. 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 Huh. So, it it's interesting. It, it's and like interesting. you said earlier, I mean, meditation is a good tool for that. I mean, it, I mean that the first yeah. verse in the Yoga Sutras is, is yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind stuff. Yoga is chitta vritti naroda, so the, it enables the mind to kind of settle down, and then you become familiarized with that settled state, and, and thereby you're not so much a slave to the fluctuations of the mind. Exactly. You have to practice going to that place. It's like, I think there are actually pathways that get developed by meditation, and the more you travel to that place of presence, or essence, whatever you want to call that, 
the more you travel to that, the easier it is to get there. And, mm -hmm. and so you, you train yourself to go to that place of presence. It takes training. And how do you get that training? Most meditation's the best way to get that training because it's a lot harder when there are distractions in your life. The, the mind is a lot more activated when you're moving around. Um, well, sometimes the mind's activated when you're quiet too, but, um, but it's, it, meditation is a way of training yourself to go to that place, practicing it. Yeah, and just as a violinist or a tennis player or any, anyone like that, um, you know, it's not just a mental training. That it, there's a neurophysiological yeah. training that takes place, and it beca they say they call it muscle memory. You know, in the case of sports, but um, I mean, they've studied the brains of long-term meditators and everything, and they they function completely differently than than the brains of someone who's never done it. So the whole physiology gets converted into a different style of functioning, and w when that happens, then there's no question of volition or you know trying to sort of manipulate things throughout the day or anything like that. It's just as automatic as breathing. Yeah, right. It is. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we speak of an awakening, and, and sometimes people uh, allude to awakening as being a, a real watershed moment, and it is. But there are awakenings as well. I mean, Adya, for instance, had an awakening when he was 25, and that was nice. And then he had uh, a much more significant one when he was 32 or something. And um, also, if we, if we sort of look at the traditions of the world in terms of what is possible for a human being's evolution, it seems there's a vast span, a vast range. Um, so I'm not sure where the question is in this, but it, I guess it was, it's more of a suggestion that, <coughs> you know, we, in a sense, we could always consider ourselves to be a beginner, no matter how advanced we are, because of the sort of the great um, potential for evolution that, that actually exists in, in life. Well, I, I think that there's just an ever deepening of realization and an ever deepening of integration after awakening. I think that awakening, though, is just such a critical, important um, occurrence. It's, mm -hmm. so, it's so important, and yet it is the bare beginnings of, of this journey, really. And I, I know that I, I'm not, I was not blasted out of the universe with the awakening that I had. And that, that was right for me. And I, it might be that I might be more integrated than some people who were blasted out, but I might not be as deeply realized. So it can, it can be all different levels of integration and realization. And then uh, Aja also talks about being open in the mind, open in the heart, and open in the gut. So there can be, um, you can be very free in the mind, but not have your heart open. Right. And, or you could be very open in the heart, perhaps, and not be as free in the mind. Yeah. And then that can vary from time to time, too. It's and such then, a well, like for instance, you had this flatness period for five years, you know, dryness period, and then something more enriched blossomed. Um, and then, like others, uh, Ramana Maharshi, for instance, and other teachers have spoken of um, awakening as uh, ultimately um, that one would actually never lose pure awareness even during sleep. That uh, it, there, there's, you know, we talk about getting overshadowed by our thoughts or identify with our thoughts. Well, how about if it could be so enlivened, the inner awareness, that even in the depth of sleep where you're snoring like a sailor, pure awareness is, is perfectly clear? Yeah, I guess that does happen. And it did happen to me for a while. For, I think, I can't even remember. I have a terrible memory, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> um, I think it for about a couple of years. Mm -hmm. All the time. Uh, yeah, I. Yeah. I didn't feel like I slept, but I knew I slept because right. I was totally fresh. Yes. But there was something awake all night long. Mm -hmm. And, and um, 
you know, even last night, I thought I felt like I was awake part of the time, but I know that I was asleep. So that is more or less the case. I think that is something that some people experience. I don't think it's really anything special, but uh, it, it is an interesting thing. Yeah. There's a verse in the Bible in the Song of Solomon. It says, I sleep, though my heart waketh. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. You have a really good memory. Yeah. <laughs> oh, do you have cheat, cheat notes right there in front no, of you? No, no, nothing. <laughs> just, just, just your books. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, have a limit, I have a limited repertoire, though. I mean, people who listen to a lot of these interviews email me and say, would you stop using the same quotes over and over again? <laughs> uh, I, ha I, know something that, I know something we could talk about. Okay. And, I, you, and I, I mentioned this in an email to you not too long ago, mm -hmm. is that... Um, you know, here we are in the Western world, and, and we're waking up, and it's not quite like the ascetic world of India. Mm -hmm. By the way, I just, I've, I've just listened to Autobiography of a Yogi on audiobook. I've got it right behind me on the show. And yeah. I just felt moved to, to listen to that again, mm -hmm. and now I know why spiritual seekers have all these fantastic ideas about awakening. Oh, there's because, all this wild stuff, yeah. Yeah, because every page is a miracle. Yeah. And that is, doesn't seem to be really happening right now. It's interesting, right. huh? Yeah. There's something di a little different is happening. And I think one of the things is just that we're in this very busy egoic culture. Mm. And how do you be awake and stay awake within this very busy culture? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting point. Um, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi brought out this thing, the TM City program, which you know what cities are. Yes. Uh, and um, one of those cities is being able to levitate, which, of course, relates to the autobiography of a yogi. And he always used to say that, you know, the reason people weren't actually achieving it is that world consciousness is so dense. Oh, and yeah. That, and that if it weren't so dense, people would actually, you'd actually that kind of thing would become commonplace. So, you know, as you say, here we are in a Western culture, and even in an Eastern culture, it's pretty dense over there, too. Um, and who knows what it might be 50 years from now, you know? I mean, the, who knows what it might be on some other planet that's a million years more evolved than ours. It, there could be stuff that would, you know, make our wildest movies seem simplistic. And, and maybe we're not even meant to have those. Maybe this maybe awakening's not. meant to look like this without those so that mm -hmm. it can be more normal. Yeah. Also, you know, if, if, At least all for now. Of, if all of these people who are waking up in these various professions and bringing in this new information, if they were to have cities, who would, that would be distracting, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, you just think what Wall Street would do with that. <laughs> 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 so, you know, all is well and wisely put. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's funny to think, I mean, imagine yourself living in the mid-1800s or in the mid-1600s or something like that. All the people who lived there took that, or the Roman Empire, all the people who lived there took their society for granted. Hey, this is normal. This is the way things are. But if we were to go in a time machine and suddenly step into that, it would seem so different to us and we would seem so different to it. And uh, and the same is true of society now. And you know, 200 years from now, it could be that you know more different. It probably will be more different than today than today is from 200 years ago. And who knows? In, in even in terms of the spiritual stuff, what might be accepted as the norm then? But for now, you know, it is what it is. And we, as you say, we're kind of this is. Da spreading like a contagion within a society uh, that you know wouldn't accept anything too weird, <laughs> and so mm -hmm. it's it's kind of people are learning how to live normal lives while you know attuned to this awakening. Yeah, and I think that can be pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. I know my my life is set up to support this awakeness. Yeah, you live in Sedona for God's sake. I mean, uh, <laughs> you can do anything you want there. <laughs> it, it makes a big difference, but I, I also really consciously have committed myself to that a long time ago. Yeah. To to that being the most important thing in my life, and to to choosing from that place, making my choices carefully that 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 they supported that. And not everybody can do that. And I talk to a lot of people who are really struggling with. Well, 
how do I be present in my job, which I don't like or which is stressful? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how, what do I do about that? And so it's, um, it's not that easy to move from ego to essence as, as I, that's, that's what I usually, how I usually describe it. You know, this moving from ego to essence it happens before awakening, not just after awakening, right? I mean, it's it's what, it's a it's the teaching that is valuable for everyone, no matter where you're at, no matter how ego identified you are, as long as you want to see what that ego is up to and want to move from ego to essence, you you can do it through practices and through learning about the ego and through making that conscious effort to be aware of your thoughts. And then, then you eventually get there. So this teaching about awakening is not just for people who are going to awaken or people who are awakened, but it's for people who may never awaken but who want to live happier, more fulfilled lives because the more aligned you are with this peace, this presence, this love essence that you are, the, the better your the more aligned your choices your life choices will be and so the more fulfilled and happy you'll be the easier li your life will go so you know it's a really a very practical teaching it really is yeah and that, that's not often mentioned I mean even even sometimes teachers are asked that question and they say no it has absolutely no you know practical significance <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I've heard Tony Parsons say that and some others that, you know it's just don't expect to get any kind of relative benefit out of it, but mm. that hasn't been my experience, and so, you know, yeah, we can hasn't been yours. So. No, you know, anybody in any moment, you can have your ego express yourself or essence express yourself, and that's the difference between heaven and hell, mm -hmm. right there. You know, is are you going to follow your mind's ideas about how to live your life? And how to and what to say and what to do, or are you going to follow something deeper that doesn't speak through your mind? That is this small, still voice, this quiet, quiet, intuitive sense that of what your heart wants to do and what your heart's moving to you and what your spontaneous movements are. Are you going to pay attention to that because that will give you the life that you're meant to have, that you're meant to be in this life. You're meant to fulfill a certain uh, potential and it's fulfilled by listening inside yourself not listening to the mind yeah and lest people feel bad about themselves because they feel like they can't live what you're saying uh, it should be mentioned that it's not always black and white on and off you yes know? it's not like an on off light switch it's more like a rheostat uh, yeah. for, for many people. You know what a rheostat is? It's like a dial yes. that you turn it up to get the light brighter and brighter by degrees. So it's it's never going to, well, not never, but it's it's often not going to be a situation where one is completely living in essence and there's no ego running the show or vice versa. Yeah. There's, there's usually some kind of blend and you can kind of favor the more, you know, constructive one, the more evolutionary one. Just give, and there's a say, another saying for you, that to which you give your attention grows stronger in your life. So if you, right. if you just sort of s steer the boat a bit more in that direction, yeah, you know, yeah. Then, it, then it'll get stronger. Right, right. And I'm glad you made that point because I, I do feel like with a website called Radical Happiness, right? Mm -hmm. My ra yeah. website's called Radical Happiness. I don't want to give people the impression that they are supposed to feel radically happy, r radical in the Radical means root happiness. It's right. the quiet happiness. It's the happiness of contentment and peace of your true nature. It's not the whoopee happiness mm -hmm. of the ego. So um, I don't want to give people the impression that they're supposed to. They're not doing it right unless they're feeling whoopee happiness all the time. Oh, no, I don't mean that at all because right. I don't feel that way. I don't want run around feeling with a great big smile on my face all the time. But there's a quiet contentment mm -hmm. and a, a uh, an appreciation of life, a gratitude, and a, a seeing of beauty everywhere that comes from being aligned with that which you are. And you know when you're aligned with it because of how it feels, and you know when you're aligned with your ego because of how it feels. It doesn't feel good. It feels contracted and tight and tense and stressed. And so that can be the guide for how to 
you know, for what you're paying attention to. If you're paying attention to something that's contracting you, which is probably a thought, then you're paying attention to the false self. And if you're paying attention to something that allows you to just rest and relax and just be in this moment and also function very effectively. Oh, look at those adorable ears. <laughs> There's the adorable face. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she just came in. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so we get feedback. I mean, we're, we are our own um, smoke alarm for, you know, there being something askew in life. And, you know, y if you tune into it, you, you, you can, you're told, you know, by what's going on in your own body, whether you're, you know, on the right track or not, whether you're sort of moving with ego or with essence, as you say. And that's the proof that life is good, that it has goodness behind it, that mm. there's benevolence behind it because it's all taking us home. It's yeah. all taking us. There is, it is possible to be happy even amidst this world where there is a, are a lot of challenges. It is possible to be happy. And that's the proof that there is goodness behind it all in spite of all of the challenges that life throws us. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, Maybe that's a good point to end on. I could, I, I, I could go on all day thinking of more things to say, and I could think of a response to that. But the, the point of there being, you know, it's a, it's a benign universe. There's goodness behind everything. There, you know, there's an evolutionary purpose to all this, and um, it's, it's a good thought to leave people with. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you want to say anything more about that before we conclude, or have you said it pretty much? Well, um, actually, I, I wrote a. I'm good, I'm, I don't mean to be plugging a book, but I, I oh, wrote yeah. a book. I, my most recent book is called Trusting Life. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it because it's such an issue for people, especially if people who have had any kind of wounding in their childhood where they felt not good enough or where they, or they had an oppressive religious kind of upbringing where, oh, you're sinful and that kind of thing. There are so many people who don't at their core believe that life is good. And that is a critical belief. It's so important to know the truth, that, it's, that life is, is good, that at its core it is about love and, it's, and it is trustworthy. It's trustworthy. Yeah, I mean, in the beginning of our talk, you were uh, talking about how a lot of highly evolved souls are born into difficult situations uh, in order to perhaps goad them uh, towards awakening and um, I don't you know in, in my own case I was I had an alcoholic father who yelled at my mother every night you know till three oh, in the morning. Oh sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> and you know she ended up commit, trying to commit suicide and ending up in mental hospitals so it was quite a scene you know um, but I remember at one point after I'd been meditating for a few years and was really enjoying the way my life was unfolding I said to my mother I said mom I said don't ever worry about how you brought me up because whatever you did I'm really happy with the way things are turning out so you must have done the right thing oh <laughs> that was sweet of you to tell her that yeah. and yeah. she really tried amidst you know very great burdens and difficulties and to, to keep it together for for the kids um, yeah. but in any case I mean I bring that point in because of what you said about this being a benevolent universe it's it's like even I that I, yeah I don't think things happen to punish us it's more yeah. like they happen to teach us and to awaken us and in some cases to give us a kick in the pants yeah yeah that's <laughs> right and the suffering is there to wake us up yeah yeah, yeah. and then when we're awake we want to ease that suffering in, in other people because it because it really is so much the mind's production mm -hmm. isn't that amazing mm -hmm. that how, how much suffering is caused by just the mind yeah Fierce grace, as Ram Dass put it after his stroke, you know. Mm. Yeah, and that that that's yeah. The grace is the the challenges. I like to use the word challenge for what life naturally brings us to evolve us, which isn't a punishment or it isn't it isn't meant for us to to suffer over. It's meant for us to find a way through it without suffering. Yeah. Find a way through it, you know. Find a way to God through it really because a lot of people do come to God from that those very kinds of crises and it, in the long run it makes us more complete too so it's not just like you know we, we 
experience really crappy circumstances in order to light a fire under us to get out of them, but having gone through them, you know, and that we mm -hmm. can look back and we can help others who are going through them, which we might not have been able to do if we, if we hadn't gone through them ourselves. Yeah. So they often say that, you know, teachers who just sort of wake up uh, without really going through very much aren't sometimes very good at relating to people on their own level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's all a training ground and a training for what we came, whatever we came here to do. All, every experience is the right experience. And even so-called wrong choices, sometimes people feel like they make a, a wrong choice or maybe a choice is actually out of alignment with what essence, how essence would move them. But even that isn't a wrong choice because that choice must have needed to be made because there was something that was being believed that caused that choice. And then by making that choice and seeing that it, that it didn't turn out well, it might cause the person then to reevaluate that belief that caused that choice. So <laughs> it's, it, you know, you can't go wrong. You keep getting uh, put back, put back on the, uh, it's a self-correcting universe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very good. Okay, so we'll end on that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a self-correcting universe. <laughs> so thanks, Gina. This has been great. And uh, I'm sure we'll meet one of these days before too long. Yes, you uh, come to Sedona. Mm, I want to. Yeah. I really want uh -huh. to. I have several friends there um, that I'd like to meet. And I had a great experience in Sedona one time. I won't go into it right now. It was just like <laughs> kind of sucked into samadhi kind of experience that I had while sitting out under the stars. Mm. Um, in any case, uh, let me wrap it up. I've, I've been talking with Gina Lake. And um, Gina, as you've just heard, lives in Sedona. Uh, but she talks to people over Skype. And she actually no, has... Oh, you don't? I thought you did. I thought you liked I don't counseling. do counseling. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you said that earlier. She writes books. And she's written, <laughs> she's written eight of them, and I think she, you've got another one in the works, probably. Uh, not quite yet. Not quite. It'll come. And <laughs> I, will, I will link to all those books. There are, are there some of the books which you would feel like, eh, people shouldn't bother with that. That was early stuff. Or do you feel like they're all still relevant? They, they are all relevant. They're, they're, they fit together really nicely. The most uh, non-dual books are Radical Happiness, mm -hmm. Anatomy of Desire, and Embracing the Now and Living in the Now are more like Eckhart Tolle type of non-dual. Yeah. Do you mm -hmm. feel it would be helpful for people to read them in the order that you wrote them, or is that not necessary? I say go with your intuition. Okay. Good. Yeah. So I'll, I'll link to them all anyway. Maybe I'll link to them in I'll link them in the order that you gave them to me in that list that you sent. Yeah. And pe people can pick and choose. Yeah, they're very inexpensive as eBooks on Kindle and other yeah, places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. All and, right. Uh, and so also, Gina has a website, and I'll be linking to that from BatGap.com. And um, as I always say at the end of these interviews, if you if you're listening to this on YouTube or something, you can subscribe to the channel, and you'll be notified whenever a new video is put up. But you could also go to batgap.com where you can subscribe to be notified by email. You can participate in discussion. You can find a link to a podcast to listen to this as an audio podcast and probably some other good stuff. There's also a donate button. So um, go there if you like. And thank you for listening or watching. And next week it will be Benjamin Smythe, who is quite a character. I'm listening to his audios now. He stands out on street corners with a sign that says, you're perfect. And he's a very funny guy, so we'll be talking to him next week. So thanks, Gina. Thank you, Rick. It was so wonderful talking with you. Yeah, we'll do thanks it Thanks for all the work you do here. Oh, thank you. I enjoy it. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.